All right, hi class. So my name is Joseph Murray and my presentation will be on my work in this class. So my research question surrounded basically precarity, which is a form of social poverty, as well as the tie-in to extremism. So my research question, I had a few. First, to what degree does precarity or fear regarding precarity cause political extremism? Second, how can precarity-based extremism be better understood? Third, how can precarity-based extremism be avoided in the future? And finally, what role, if any, does the status quo and their leaders play in the creation of political extremism? So if we were to bunch that into one main question, it would be how can we better understand and avoid extremism in the future specific to precarity? So why? Why do we ask these questions and why does it matter? Well, I have a quote by Malcolm X. It says, education is the passport to the future for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. The reason why I asked these questions was because I wanted to have a better understanding of why extremism happens because I'm not a fan of when it happens and I would like it to stop in the future. And asking why really truly is one of the most important things that we as humans can do, not just academically or politically, but in everything. If you think about the very beginning of time, the creation of knowledge was founded on asking why. Why does my stomach rumble? A caveman might've thought to himself, well, maybe you're hungry, you should go out and find food. If you feel really sick when you eat a certain type of berry, you might ask, why is it that I always feel sick when I eat that type of berry? One might then conclude that that berry is poisonous and that if I want to eat, I should probably eat something else. So asking why is truly is the foundation of all knowledge, even as basic as what should I eat or why? Asking why, why are people so unhappy? Well, now we can go into psychology and better, better understand the human experience. Why does extremism happen? is how we can generate knowledge for understanding it. A lot, of, a lot has been made that I've noticed about the occurrence of extremism insofar as once it's already happened, right? If a bad event happens that's politically extreme, a lot of study, a lot of research, a lot of time is devoted to the actual incident itself, but a lack of understanding of the core concepts that allowed for such a thing to happen that is not fully researched. And that is why we have to ask why it's necessary. So precarity, before we go into the finer details, I found it best to define precarity for you guys so that we can be on the same page here. I took this definition out of a book on precarity and the definition is this, precarity, a condition resulting from an employment regime in which deregulated labor markets give rise to various types of insecure work in which social protections are minimized and in which the ability to plan a coherent future is compromised. The precarity of today is linked to neoliberalism, which proposes that human well being can be best advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms. Walsh, 2019. So precarity is very similar to poverty insofar as it is defined by an inability to really secure your station in life and promote health and well-being within your family and your community, and then move up the ladder, right? So the most precarious individuals we would see today in the West would be like the lower classes of society, um, people who aren't quite in the middle class, economically speaking. Precarity can also be a social thing, right? So if you feel as though you are left out or not properly understood or in any other way marginalized, you too are part of the precarity, even if you do have that economic component. So we see that in a lot of minorities and other groups that aren't properly supported by society. And when this happens, precarity, precarity, either being in it or simply fearful of starting to become in it can elicit a fearful response. And when fearful responses occur, it is the hypothesis of my research and my paper that that is where extremism comes from. So workforce and identity. After I did a lot of research specific to what precarity is, I, I then started to think about how and why precarity would be so important because there 
were a lot of academic tie-ins specific to precarity's influence on politics. And one of the most salient angles that I found that was echoed in a lot of writing on precarity was the psychological component. And there was a very transdisciplinary lens that was cast on the study of precarity. I found a lot of papers and journals and even a few books from leadership studies, but it was also extensively covered in historical anthropology and psychology as well. So there was a journal titled Career Commitment and Collectivist and Individualistic Cultures, a Comparative Study. And this was conducted by a few psychologists who were trying to understand how and why the workforce the economy and other such factors would influence your identity. And what they actually found is that one's career, one's means of wealth or security is one of the top three influences on how you create a sense of self. So what, what they found was your family, your culture, and your work are the three biggest determining factors on how you perceive yourself and how you will carry yourself through your career, your life, and these sorts of things. So we have here a woman who is a small business owner, a farmer, and a United States Marine. What you may have noticed in your personal life is if you meet someone and say, oh, well, what do you do? Or who are you? They would say, oh, I'm a business owner. Oh, I'm a farmer. Or, hey, I'm a Marine. Very, they don't necessarily open a conversation with, oh, hi, I'm a Catholic, or, oh, hi, I'm an atheist. It's, hi, I'm a fill-in-the-blank with your career. And the fact that that is so close to the tip of the tongue that the first thing people think about when they are introducing themselves as their career, that shows subconsciously within the human psyche how important and how the career is in the forefront of people's perceptions of themselves. And this does tie back into precarity and extremism, because We'll get into themes later specific to the economy and extremism, but the workforce, your career, your identity is one of the few things that can be changed, right? Because the other two determining factors were your culture and your family, and your family is your family, whether they are in the same state as you or not, whether they are in the same house as you, they are your family, and that will not change even after they pass. They, you still know that they're your family. Nobody can take that away from you. Same with your culture. Work, however, is based on the economy, and the economy changes every day. So one of the other things that these psychologists found in their study was that not only is it one of the most important, but it's also the workforce that is being the most important, but that the workplace, the economy, and their career is also the most vulnerable to, ch to detrimental change. So after reading a lot of papers specific to the workforce's role and identity, the most valuable tie-in that I found was that it's also the most vulnerable. So if it's the most vulnerable to change to bad actions, bad things happening, it would deserve further study to try and understand how. So to continue it down with the psychological angle on the workplace and precarity, we started, I started to then dive into some of the causes and perceptions of why and how homelessness happens and what those who are homeless perceive about the world around them. So there is a quote by Ralph Ellison. It says, when I discover who I am, I will be free. Now, if you discover who you are and that is taken from you, you would be the opposite of free. You would be marginalized and you would be precarious. Precarity, back to our old definition, you could argue are people who are losing who they are due to outside factors. So homelessness, homeless people are a great example of people who are abridged from that which they need. And they're, so I started to dive into the psychological psychological perspectives specific to identity for homelessness and homeless people. And there was a really good study and cited down there below metaphors and homeless discourse and research exploring pathways, careers, and safety nets. This was again by a psychologist. And what he found is that homeless people are, as far as the different groups, demographics of people mm -hmm. that exist, homeless people have the biggest struggle mm -hmm. with their ability to conceptualize their self within their station in life. So 
back to the old example of if you meet someone, they might say, oh, hi, I'm a police officer or hi, I'm a Marine. Hi, I'm this. Hi, I'm that. Hi, I'm a farmer. When you ask these questions to a homeless person, they often struggle to answer who they are because they aren't quite sure. And they're not quite sure because they're alone without the three most important things that make you who you are. So this, although it doesn't directly tie into political extremism, the homelessness angle still, I found, really painted a clear picture. Just another example of how important the things that make you, you are. So we now know that not only is your work so important that it influences your identity within your career, but that without your work, serious problems start to occur and you have an inability to conceptualize yourself. That shows how important it is. So that takes us to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. There was a really good article written that really stuck out to me. And it was a guideline basically of how the hierarchy of needs can be translated into your own personal life. And again, cited below, what he found is that different stations in life, whether you're going through an economic downturn, whether you just graduate college, when you're about to retire, the steps that you take to improve your position within your own personal life quite closely mimic Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So as a refresher for Maslow's hierarchy of needs, one's most basic needs are the physiological needs. So that would be something like food or water. If you are starving to death, you're not going to really worry about trying to self-actualize your cultural best. And after physiological, we have safety, right? Once you've satisfied those basic needs of food, water, shelter, you are then going to try and build safety nets around yourself so that bad actors or simply even sometimes just unlucky situations do not take away those physiological needs. Once you've secured your safety, you're going to look, you're going to look outward to others. This is when we start to get into the identity and self-perception. Who am I? How do I fit into society? Do I have friends? How can I have more friends? Do my friends agree with what I think politically? Am I can I agree with my friends socially? Do I like the same things they do? Once So once you secure that safety, you start to look outwards towards others, the world around you. After you've looked to the world around you and began to really secure yourself within the social world, the next rung of needs that one would try and satisfy are based on esteem. So basically the social needs area is entering the social world and carving out a spot for yourself within it. However, esteem is more focused on once you're there, how can you maximize your position? How can you be more popular? How can you be more affluent, more successful? These sorts of things. And Maslow argues that once you've achieved that, the last thing that you would want to actualize within your own self is basically becoming the best possible version. And that's what self-actualization is. It is becoming the best possible version of yourself. And obviously, you cannot have the top tiers of this hierarchy without the bottom tiers. Without physiological needs, there is no safety. Without safety, there is no social. Without social, there is no esteem. Without esteem, there cannot be any self-actualization. Matthew is the person who I cited for this article, also found that the majority of people he argues close to about 70% of people are in the blue to purple area, still focusing on being able to make your house payments, still focusing on maintaining your relationships, these sorts of things. And what he found is that once the world around people becomes dangerous or hostile enough that there is a risk or a fear that somebody might go down the ladder, people start to, again, as we saw with some of the other articles, act out of fear. And that is a theme that will present itself throughout this presentation. When your social, like if there was a time in your life where you were having your social needs met, but some event means that you now aren't meeting your social needs or potentially even not meeting your basic safety needs, people are gonna start to act out and sometimes irrationally. So this combining of the psychological hierarchy of needs with the realistic job economy, one can then argue that given the importance and centrality of your work to yourself, if your work is to take a hit, so too will your 
identity. And once your work takes a hit, once you go down the rung of ladders, you're going to look for ways to alleviate that. Political extremism predicts beliefs in conspiracy, theory, in conspiracy theories. This was a very good, really, really, really good journal that I read, basically trying to give a psychological perspective on how and why individuals would look towards things on the political extreme. I'm going to read a quote out to you and then tie it into the project. We have here, what is that? The article, Political Extremism Predicts Belief in Conspiracy Theories in the Journal of Social, Psychological, and Personality Studies argues that extreme political ideologies are responsible for several of the major human tragedies in the previous century, both at the left, communism, and at the right, extreme fascism. Although these ideolog ideologies differ substantially in content, it has been argued that extreme, extreme ideologies are grounded in a similar underlying psychology. Understanding this underlying psychology is necessary for explaining why rigid adherence to political ideology can have such destructive consequences. Historical records suggest that the tragedies caused by extremism are rooted substantially in a tendency to be distrustful and paranoid towards groups of other minded individuals as reflected in a belief in conspiracy theories. As a case in point, a core assumption underlying the Holocaust was the belief in a Jewish conspiracy for world domination combined with the belief in a Jewish conspiracy causing the Germans to have defeat in World War I. Likewise, most communist regimes were characterized by a fear for conspiracies, therefore suspecting any citizen that had even the slightest connection with the imperial West of being a potential enemy or the state or spy. So that was a lot, but let's unpack it. What this article is arguing is that there is a us versus them mentality that is very prevalent once a sect of people break towards extremism. As it said, the us versus them would be true German quote unquote versus the Jewish infiltrators is how the argument was put forth during World War II and communism, it's us versus the West, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But the theme here that showed itself through all the political articles that I had to analyze was there was a qualitative thing that you could really identify the us versus them, us versus them over and over and over. So that would prompt one to ask why, why is there an us versus them mentality? Why is it that certain groups of people within any system feel as though it's, they are working against the system or in some cases why the system is working against them. And, that really drove my research into a more systemically curious manner because the theme kept on appearing time after time after time again, us versus them. So why? Why does that occur? Well, let's think about it. In the 21st century, extremism has not gone away. There is... Some would even argue it is on the uptick. Crenshaw wrote a book called Explaining Terrorism. And in his book, he argues first that extremism is on the rise. And second, that it is on the rise because of a failure for leaders to provide effective countermeasures against extremism. He argues that the leaders of the West today are very effective at labeling extremism as extreme and very effective at identifying it as bad. However, in his book, he makes an argument that simply identifying bad things as bad is not really enough if you want to understand or stop what's going on. So he said that identifying the problem being ex extremism is fine, but until you understand, assess, and change the causes, it will never go away. And every time somebody simply says it's bad, but does not take concrete actions against the causes, it will actually grow, extremism that is, it will grow in a microcosm of hate. And that occurs because, again, the leaders are not identifying the actual problems that people who are forced to go to the extreme have to deal with. Slow rise. If you go back to the last slide about extremism and terrorism, that made me start to wonder, okay, so if simply identifying it isn't enough, then how can we identify what has to actually change? And that took me to a book called The Nazi Seizure of Power 
It was written by William Sheridan Allen. And what he found is that there's two forms of extremism and only one is identified by the status quo. Extremism is a long form occurrence and it is a short term occurrence. Things like the Holocaust, things like the collapse of societies or economies, those would be short term examples of extremism. And that is what's usually gathers all the attention of the media. That's what gathers the attention of the politicians and leaders. But the short term extremism, the actual extreme actions, these are not where the problem lies, according to him. So William Sheridan Allen conducted a decade long mm -hmm. study into the history of individuals who in Germany during the 30s were very anti-establishment. And again, the theme shows itself that the average people in this country at this time felt like the system was working against them and that they felt as though the solutions provided by the leaders were not actually identifying or addressing the issues that they had with the world at the time. And that was what was identified as long form extremism, one's tendency to drift away from this norm, drift away from the status quo, drift away from having any faith or trust in the system. And that is the long form extremism that oftentimes goes unaddressed. And that this lack of faith and lack of loyalty or lack of simply even playing by the rules that happens on a very small scale for many, many years is where extremism actually comes from. It does not come from the occurrence of the bad event, but rather it comes from the years of drifting away before. So what does that have to do with Europe, right, and politics? Well, the West is founded on something called Western Enlightenment. We have a picture of lockup on the screen. Basically, the Summarizing argument of the Western Enlightenment is that you will be able to free yourself, fix your family, and improve your station in life if you devote yourself towards the being the best you can. It's very similar to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. As you scale up your position in life, as you work in your career, as you save your money, as you provide for others, and as you perform your civic duty to your government, you will become free. And in freedom, you can then chase after things like the arts and all the wonderful, wonderful aspects of society that most people do not get to in the precariat take a part of. So when we look at how the West is founded and we compare and contrast that to the precariat that we talked about earlier, one would notice then that the precarious individuals in society are not partaking in Western society, how it was set up by the Western Enlightenment to occur. Western Enlightenment argues that you have to take part in society, you have to look out for yourself individually and make yourself work within the system. And when a system is built that way, but large swaths of people are disengaging from society, clearly they will not mix, it will not work. It is like mm -hmm. war and oil, they cannot coexist. And when they cannot coexist, that is where extremism comes from. And that trend is a trend that is very noticeable in academic literature, but it is also noticeable in the actions of those who have gone towards the extreme. There is a very famous picture of one of these signs at one of the German concentration camps, and it says, Arbeit Mark Free, that is German for work will set you free. And this was put up in jest. There's a really good book called Holocaust Business, Some Reflections on Arbeit, Mark Free. And what the author found was that this sign was not actually put up to encourage people to work, but rather was put up as an ironic, basically political symbolism against the Western Enlightenment, because a lot of the people who orchestrated this event were very fed up with the system as it were, in the years prior, these were the people who were not really chasing the enlightenment like we see here. They were not succeeding. They were in the precariat. They were not rising up on the hierarchy of needs, but rather they were getting left behind and they were failing to move up. They were moving down. So what they found is that a lot of workers in Germany, and this is tradesmen, factory workers, shoemakers, bakers, truck drivers, these sorts of people, they felt most of the majority, not all, but the majority felt like they were working for nothing because they were 
going through the processes. They were doing their 40 or 50 hours a week. They were abiding by the laws. And even though they were doing these things, they kept on sliding down within society. So they were basically, if we'll work for nothing, so will you. And that is a problem, right? Because this shows a, again, a separation from the status quo. It shows a lack of faith in the system. It shows people who do not have any care in the world to try and preserve the systems of old. And if people do not want to preserve the systems of old, the systems of old will collapse. And when collapses happen, bad things happen. But this is not a trend that is just identifiable within the last hundred years, however. This trend of losing faith in your systems is actually as old as history itself. There was a really good book detailing all of the finite causes for the late Bronze Age collapse. Mm -hmm. And what it found is that the exact same things as 1930s, 1940s Europe, the exact same things happened thousands and thousands of years ago. So there was a historical incident in the late Bronze Age where within about the span of 50 or so years, every single civilization that was thriving during the Bronze Age all collapsed. And they collapsed right after currency was formed. What this book found and what it argued was that all of the civilizations who had at one time used bartering systems for means of wealth, once they moved to currencies, the leaders started to chase currency rather than by chase rather than chasing the health of their system their people their farmers that sort of thing and over a few generations the farmers of the late bronze age were starting to become very fed up with the leaders the kings the monarchs of the late bronze age because again the leaders were chasing money rather than providing the services, the needs, the requirements for safety, the requirements for esteem, social needs. If you go back to Maslow's hierarchy, the leaders stopped trying to pro promote people to achieve these necessities. And as we saw with this example in Europe, when people are not able to meet the needs, when people are not able to get what they need, when people are not able to promote themselves up the ladder, they disengage. So. During the late Bronze Age, the ways that are, there were no standing armies, there, there was no full time military, there were no barracks, no military bases. What would happen is if an enemy force showed itself on the horizon, the town, the, the city, the fort, whatever, they would raise an alarm. And when this alarm was raised, it was the assumption that the working class men of the surrounding farmland would show up and defend the town from the invaders. They would show up with pitchforks, bow and arrows, knives, whatever. And this is where the term raising an army or raising a militia comes from. You would have to basically hope that in the heat of the moment, the people would show up when they were called upon. And one can surmise, obviously, that if the majority of working class men do not have any faith or any loyalty towards a system, if that system calls on them, they're not going to show up. And sure enough, there were a group of invaders called the Sea People. His history is not able to identify where it is the Sea People came from. However, they definitely know where it is the Sea People attacked. The Sea People attacked Egypt. They attacked Sumer, Mesopotamia. They attacked a lot of the Greek city-states. They attacked Sicily, Corsica and even certain parts of Northern Africa and modern day Libya. And every time these people would go and raid a city or attack a town, they would walk right through the front gates and nobody was there to meet them, no soldiers, no militias. And what they found is the people in all of these civilizations were so tired and fed up with a system that they didn't approve of, that when the alarms for raising the militia came, nobody showed up and simply Again, disengaging from society is a form of extremism. It is extreme because it is giving up and turning your back on your very home. What would cause somebody to literally turn their back on the place they've known and the place they've worked and lived in their whole life? Well, precarity, right? Precarity, when people cannot provide for themselves, they will look elsewhere for the basic needs of survival, and they will have no loyalty and no urge to provide provide safety and security for the leaders who failed to provide safety and security for them. It's also occurred in Rome, where the leaders of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire, the Roman 
Rome fell multiple times, but the Roman government, the leaders, the politicians were failing to provide for the basic needs of the people. The inflation was very high and rampant in the Roman Empire because it kept on rapidly expanding and, and the Romans had to pay for their military somehow. The massive expansion of slavery with every place that would be invaded was decreasing the value of work within the homeland. So if you picture it, every time Rome would capture a new city, that city would be turned into slaves and those slaves would be taken back to the homeland and the influx of workers decreased the value of work because now it's the competition. Why, why would you pay somebody X amount of money when you can do it for free with a slave? That really killed the working class in Rome every time those things were brought into the cities. It killed the working class. So much like the Bronze Age here, issues economically speaking were starting to occur where more and more and more members of Roman society were becoming more and more precarious. It was no longer a competition to try and rise up the ranks. There was no longer an ability to have upward mobility on Maslow's hierarchy of needs or economically. People were simply just starting to collapse and crumble. They weren't able to support themselves. And the failure of leadership in Rome is evident because the working class people were begging for food. What the Roman government instead did was they held quarterly circuses and quarterly Colosseum fights. This is where the whole blood and circus example come from. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that. It was a very big thing historically. The government in Rome found that it would be cheaper to host in a quarterly circus and a quarterly Colosseum fight than to feed an entire country. So they were trying to win the people over by providing them things that would help on Maslow's esteem, right? Because enjoying your place in society, having a fun time, having fun activities to go to with your friends, which a circus would be, would fix Maslow's esteem hierarchy. However, Rome is not at the esteem level. Rome was basically trying to cover their physiological and safety needs. And as the psychological paper on needs are argued, when you cannot provide for basic necessities, your interests are not higher up the ladder. So Rome, the leaders were trying to give high class fulfillment solutions to low class low class fulfillment needs, obviously the solutions that the government was providing did not actually help the people. And as such, the people had no, they, they did not care if Rome fell. So when the Gothic barbarians from modern day Germany and France walked into Rome, the, mil the military, at this time, there were some standing militaries, the military, the generals, nobody wanted to help the government. They literally unlocked the doors and let the barbarians walk right on through into Rome. And this is another example where failing to provide actual solutions to actual problems makes people move away. You know, it makes people not care. It makes people not want to help. And when people don't want to help, the system collapses because Rome had enough weapons Rome had enough people to fight off the barbarians. It, it had enough money. The money was just in the wrong hands and the people didn't care enough to use the weapons. So it's truly really an example where one band of rebels destroyed an entire empire. But the truth is that empire destroyed itself. It destroyed itself by weakening the people and refusing to look out for them. When you refuse to look out for people, they're not going to look out for you. So World War I. World War I, again, was much the same. Precarity, actually, there's a really good book called The Child of the Barbarian Rape, Race, Nationalism in France During the First World War. This book was an this book was offered to try and offer an alternate reason for why World War I happened, because the conventional wisdom regarding World War I is multinational alliances caused World War I because people had to go to war. And that is true. But like I said earlier, you cannot just look at the symptoms of extremism. You have to look at the causes. And during this time in the early, early 20th century, there was a shift in the world away from, I always say, away from monarchy, away from authoritarianism and towards democracy, right? So there was the way nationalism occurred was changing. The history books are correct in blaming nationalism, but what type, right? It used to be 
nationalism where you would help your king, where you would provide for your kingdom. And now that people were starting to have votes, they were starting to have democracy. There was a lot of competition for politics within countries that did not previously occur. And the leaders at the very top of the um, various countries were starting to themselves feel precarious, right? Because before democracy, there wasn't really a viable challenge to the ruling class. But once democracy was in vogue and starting to happen all across Europe, the ruling class was losing power. And as we know, when you move down your ladder of hierarchy of needs, well, you feel precarious, right? And in this case, it would be people at the top rungs going down to the middle, but it's all the same. When you move down the ladder, you act out of fear. So these people were afraid that revolution rebellion was going to happen. So they started to then get alliances to help themselves in the case of an uprising. However, the main point here is, yes, alliances caused it. Yes, nationalism caused it. But why did the governments have to have alliances? Well, it's because the ruling class was losing their station in life and they acted out of fear to try and preserve it. Well, we all know the end result of World War I. This is just another example as to why precarity matters. Doesn't matter who you are, where you are, what your job is, or what you're trying to do. If you feel precarious, you might do something bad. So what? What then? Well, leaders need to provide actual solutions to actual problems that working class individuals need help with. As we've seen, there's a litany of historical perspectives pursuant to the notion that people will act out, potentially maybe acting out of fear, acting out of anger in some cases, like with the Holocaust, but acting out all the same when the things they need fixed are not fixed by the people who are there to fix them, right? The government is there for a reason. The government is there to provide a solution to problems. It's there to provide safety and security. Mm -hmm. If the people who are supposed to provide safety and security refuse or fail to do so, the people that they're supposed to be working for are going to not work for them either. So, when you refuse to protect the common man, the common man will turn against you. And that is a lesson that the collapse of all these great empires learned the hard way. And these are themes that have shown themselves throughout the literature in my project and throughout history itself. People are creatures and we have psychological wants and needs. Every human wants to scale themselves up on the hierarchical ladder of society, every single person. Nobody wants to be worse off today than they were yesterday. And when people see themselves becoming worse off as time moves on, they are going to feel fed up with the system. So you have to make sure that you are able to provide the ability for people to scale themselves up. When people feel as all they can do is fall down the ladder, they will act out. They will act out in fear, fear for losing what they care about, right? If you go back to identity, fear for losing their position in their work fear for losing their ability to provide for their family. And that is the basic thing that all people will fight for. So when the system fails to provide solutions, the people will look for solutions outside of the system. It's very simple. That's one of the things that we saw in, again, Germany with the Holocaust. The status quo, so the conservatives and the social democrats were the two ruling um, electoral parties in pre-Nazi Germany. Both of those political parties were failing to solve any of the problems in Germany. So the German people then decided to look for solutions outside of the system, and that's where the Nazi party came from. But the argument here that I'm making, the thing that you need to understand, is that people will not stay in a system that doesn't work for them. Perhaps it's just as simple as not showing up when the call to arms is made. Perhaps it's, you know, letting the gate open for the barbarians in Rome, or perhaps it's making your own political system. Whatever it is, people will look for solutions outside of the system. And when people go outside of the system, that is where extremism occurs. Extremism naturally, is not the norm, right? If you think about politics on a spectrum, the things that are common, the things that are normal, the things that the majority of people do are not extreme. For it to be extreme, it has to be on the fringe. Well, when you leave the norm, you are on the fringe. When governments fail, when leaders fail to provide solutions, people become extreme. There is a consideration, however, the civil rights movement of the 60s in America offers a different perspective, one that does need further research, one that could actually provide a new perspective, which could help even more. 
in the civil rights movement, marginalized groups, African Americans, and even a few other groups were really starting to want the system to work for them. Because in this time, many of them didn't have the right to vote, even if they did have the right to vote, it was made near impossible with bad things like Jim Crow, it was harder to get loans for houses, hard to get jobs, these sorts of things. So these individuals were fighting back against the system. But they did not leave, right? These people did not start war on the streets. They did not burn down their politicians' houses. They didn't do any of these things. They simply argued their case publicly and hoped that democracy would agree. And it ended up did agreeing, right? They were, well, it's still a work in progress, but they, a lot, they made a lot of successful victories during this time. So the civil rights movement provides a perspective that when you don't burn things to the ground, you might actually end up better off. So what we can see here is people who were left behind by society in the civil rights movement, but chose to not go outside of the system anyways, were able to find a way to make the system work for them. So the argument here would be that learn from the civil rights, respect the civil rights, and appreciate it for what it was. It was a massive, massive victory for what is good and what is right in the world. And they did not have to start a war. They did not have to destroy their own empire. They did not have to do any of these things. They did not have to, they didn't have to make concentration camps to get revenge. They simply did the right thing. When people want change, but they still have a respect and a loyalty for what they are trying to change, outcomes are better. So we have to make revolutions look peaceful like this. We do not want revolutions to look violent like this. And the way, the way you do that is by respecting your people enough to give them a reason to stay. So what do I recommend then? Well, I recommend that we have to understand that extremism is the long-form consequences of systemic failure. I hope that you understand that in order to deal with extremism, you must first identify why the status quo is failing. Because when extremism does not occur when things are going good, they occur when things are going bad. So I would recommend that you focus your efforts on looking at why things are going bad rather than looking at how people are trying to make things go better. You have to shift from an external locus of control to an internal locus of control. What this means is leaders have to look at what they can do to make the situation better rather than simply calling the situation bad. Having an external locus of control would be something to say, oh, well, yes, the people who did not show up to defend the empire of Rome were at fault and Rome fell because those people are lazy and they need to be better. That is not effective. That does not solve the problem. Having an internal locus of control would say, I could have made those people want to defend the kingdom and I failed. I need to make a better kingdom so they have a reason to work with me. So if you shift from blaming extremism to working to fix it, that will make the world better. Calling extremism bad is accurate. It is. Um, bad things happen when extremism occurs, but calling something bad doesn't change it. If I call, if I call coffee coffee, it's still coffee. If I call a car a vehicle, it's still a car. Calling extremism bad doesn't change that it's still happening. So we have to shift that focus away from browbeating it and shifts towards accommodating it to make it less extreme, to decrease the bad actions that happen. And when all this happens, you have to, again, remember why it is that the precariat people feel that they need to change, what it is that makes them feel insecure with their station in life. And then we have to simply provide for the well-being and the basic needs and the psychological needs of people who are struggling. If we provide a way for them to find success, they will not themselves look for a way to get revenge. So that's the summary of the research that I've found. There's still a lot more work to be done if this problem at a systemic or political level is to be changed. But the main themes I found were that 
people want better. When people don't get better, they're going to look for better wherever they can. And you want to make sure that they don't look for that in harmful ways. So if leaders can provide better solutions, people wouldn't be struggling as much. So that's what I have. I hope you guys liked it. Thank you.